Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, hello to our YouTube viewers. Uh, today, we are together with Professor Gerg Rose. Uh, I have been watching him uh, like uh, maybe for the last two, three years. And uh, he was kind of a very famous guy in education uh, sector. And uh, even the like most uh, like I, I watched a video uh, about uh, Ken Robinson uh, in the TED Talks, and he, uh, it was a revolutionary talk for me uh, because all the things that we are working for, uh, all the things that we are dreaming uh, was uh, actually based on his ideas and his approach. And Professor Gerg Rose uh, was uh, someone that worked with him uh, as well. Uh, he, they, they were uh, very close friends, and also uh, uh, he's working as uh, he's working in Kitzania Global uh, uh, as a global director of education. Uh, and we met finally uh, two weeks ago, uh, two to three weeks ago, and we had a great chat. And we wanted to uh, like repeat this chat uh, with your uh, questions as well. So please feel free to uh, get involved from YouTube chat screen. In the second part of our talk today, uh, Professor Gagros will be answering your questions as well. Uh, and I, ha I have prepared some uh, for the first part. So Professor, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to, it's a pleasure to be with you and to be with Twin Science, that's excellent. Yeah, it's a pleasure for us as well, uh, because you are such a treasure and we want to like, uh, we want to we want to witness uh, your experiences and your learnings uh, uh, from your uh, working life, professional life. And also uh, in our chat, we have discussed about uh, 21st century, what will be the future of the education and, uh, and we will try to understand how the future of the education will shape by looking to history, like to last maybe 200 years, 250 years. And your um, experiences will help a lot. Maybe uh, I can start with the first question. Uh, so uh, we know that like after COVID, it is more visible and easily understandable that world has global problems, right? So today uh, the world faces not only the health problem, but uh, we have uh, climate problems. Uh, there's a need for transition to renewable energy, to sustainable energy consumption, or there are problems with the uh, poverty, uh, with uh, equal uh, education opportunities. So we are facing those kind of uh, challenges uh, uh, and these pro problems somehow uh, that we are experiencing were caused by the decisions that our ancestors took uh, for the last 200 years ago. And I don't believe that scientists were dreaming about climate change while inventing like the steam engines, right? So they were trying to solve uh, problems and make life practical. Uh, and when you look to the like, last 200 years and the inventions and the science, how do you evaluate the advancement of technology? Uh, and what do you think that was missing, if any, uh, so that we have this kind of uh, society right now? Thank you. Firstly, when I, so when you asked me to look back 200 years, that is not as a personal experience. So I'm not 200 years old for anybody who's sitting out there, but, but, I, but I can reflect. And I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. And actually, it's a question that is very pertinent now as well. And I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a little bit. So firstly, I think we need to distinguish between the invention, if you wish, the, the science and the application of the science and the consequences of the application. So what I mean by that is I don't for a minute think that anything has ever been invented intentionally to do harm and to do wrong. And I think it would be fair to say that, that the intentions are, the, the intention of an invention is always to, to solve a problem or to make something better. And, and sometimes that making it better is for the greater good. 
So if you think of the invention of penicillin, for example, and, and sometimes it is for financial gain. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but sadly, I think never for the financial gain of all, but much more often for the financial gain of relatively few people. For example, the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, so the Industrial Revolution did not make, in, in, in the first instance at all, everybody better off, but it did, it made, it made some people much better off. Yeah. And, and sometimes we also have that the, invention, the, the inventions and intentions for the greater good uh, then do become commercial. And, and we call that outsourcing. And, and we'll come onto that as well. I think um, the application of the invention is where the problem lies. And I think when we have regulation, it gets in the way of short-term profiteering, the quick book, uh, but it is invaluable in terms of long-term sustainability, both for the greater good and commercially. Mm -hmm. And I think where we need to look at in, in very simplistic terms is a kind of capitalism that genuinely goes hand in hand with the aim to make the world a better place. Because the consequence of the profit, of, of the extreme profit model, has been that regulation is not always good and is not always strong enough and timely enough. And that we have become very good at pressing the start button, but we are not very good at pressing the pause or indeed the stop button. So a very simple example. When we brought, uh, uh, when Western cultures brought tobacco back to the West, uh, I'm sure that at the time nobody thought that it would do the harm that it, that it does, cigarettes. It, it's taken a very long time for people to begin to press the pause button, knowing the harm it did. So I think the, 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 the problem lies with the intervention and the availability of good, transparent, objective data. Mm -hmm. and, and I just wanted to use a few examples. If, if I go back to the, to the Industrial Revolution, for example, there's very clear evidence that that made, it speeded things up, it made, it made a number of people very wealthy and very influential, and it changed society's dynamics. However, at the very same time, in a northern English city called Manchester, the, the working conditions, uh, the, the living conditions, excuse me, of the working people were so poor that it moved a man called Friedrich Engels to write to his friend Karl Marx about these appalling working conditions. And those letters influenced Karl Marx's writing of Das Kapital, for example. So, so we have to understand that invention in that sense was used not for, not for the best. So like uh, you are saying, uh, while uh, while um, do, like during the first days of industrial revolution, the working conditions of the people of the yeah. society were low and very problematic, right? Yes, and uh, and at the same time, there was there was enough wealth available created by the industrial revolution that could have improve the housing of those people, for example. And there's an interesting example of this. So if you, I don't know if you're familiar with the Cadbury family in, in the United Kingdom, the, the, the chocolate brand Cadbury, of course, is, is known all over the world. Well, the Cadbury family were what I would call industrialists with a heart, who did do the right thing. So when they, from a Quaker background, when the brothers saw the, the appalling living standards in the city of Birmingham, in, the, in this case, in around 1880, 1890, they decided that things could be done better and they wanted a factory in the country. So they bought a farm and they named it Bourneville. And by 1880, a huge factory had been constructed with hundreds of homes, gardens, fruit trees, uh, in, in, in keeping with the brothers' wish uh, that there should be no dwelling where, quote unquote, where a rose cannot grow. So you all of a sudden then had a family that became very wealthy as part of this whole industrial movement, but that included in the accumulation of, of wealth, all the people 
who contributed to it. So, so there would be a very good example of, of an invention that was commercial, that had commercial and profit motives behind it, but it was applied in a different way. So, so my point is, very often we will look and say, ah, but when they invented, uh, when they started flying on aeroplanes, nobody thought of climate change. Very true. And there would have been no evidence of that. But as more and more aeroplanes occupied airspace and we learned from the data, the damage that was done, nobody interfered. Nobody stepped up to the mark and said, we've got to be careful here. This is wrong. We as an industry and as leaders of countries, we need to become very early, proactive, intervene and make this better. And I think, I think that is where, where much of the problem lies, that we have, that we have no system for intervention. Yeah, perfect. Like, uh, uh, this is the first time I hear about Canberra family, and it is a great example of, uh, like, uh, being responsible from the society yes. that you are involved in, and also doing work together, right? Uh, developing together, succeeding together. It's a great example yeah. of that. And, uh, like, I wonder, so there's a family in 1880s during the mm -hmm. Industrial Revolution in UK following this path. And there yeah. are many other examples, like maybe Canberra family is one, yeah. we can increase this number to 10 maybe, I don't know. But we have lots of different examples who followed the way of maybe, uh, let's say, capitalism and, yeah. and did not care about the others. So, what was different about their perspective, like Cambry's, Cambry family perspective? So how do they uh, actually uh, decided, how, how did they decide to move this way? What was I, th I, think, the, I think the answer is, is very likely to be that the Cambry family were from a Quaker background. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the Quakers uh, essentially is a, is, is a movement that that seeks to do good. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so it, it is their background. My, but I don't think certainly not in this day and age. And I'll give you a, a 2021 example. I think in this day and age, we don't have to be born into anything. We are uh, knowledgeable enough to know how to change things for the better. Right? We don't have to rely on individual families. So for example, I'm. Um, I'll give you two examples, one, one, one a, a, a worrying one and one, I think, a hopeful one. So, so one of the things that I worry about is, um, is cosmetic surgery, for example. Yeah? Massive amounts of money and profits are made through, through cosmetic surgery. And, and in many cases, I don't think we have the evidence to see what the long-term damage might be yeah? of, of Botox or implants. And the question is, who is monitoring this? And when we find out that things are going wrong, who will interfere, who will intervene and say no more? So that's a very practical example that's going on right now. And I think globally, as well as nationally, in a number of cases, there is no system, no proper system in place that, that sets alarm bells ringing. So that, that's a, a worrying one. I'm also concerned about the impact of technology and the opportunities missed. Now, I, I, uh, I've got all. I've got an iPhone. I've got a laptop. We've got all. We have all these things. And, and for years, I've been promised that technology would make my life easier. And I promise you, it has not made it easier. I probably work <laughs> harder, but certainly work longer hours now than I ever have done because I work globally and I can be reachable from Los Angeles at any time by text, by FaceTime, by Zoom or whatever it's become. And, and actually it hasn't made my working life easier. It has made it busier and at times, I suppose, more stressful. Now, we could change that, couldn't we? Can you imagine a scenario in 2050 where we will be working three days per week, not five days, and uh, we, where we will be deploying ourselves for our for the time of our two free days that we will be volunteering or 
taking part in art experiences or sport or child minding or looking after our grand grandchildren and, 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 and that we can afford this if there is the, the will, the vision, the democratic movement that says we will have a tech tax and, mm -hmm. and a tax on excessive wealth, particularly of companies, for example, because that is what we democratically wanted. And all of a sudden you can see through such a change of hearts and minds, you can see a reinvention of Cadbury's Bourneville. Yeah? Bourneville 2050 could be that our living standards and conditions and our equality are actually improved because, a, because commercial inventions have been used to A, make everybody's lives better. And of course, by doing that, you create separate economies anyway because for those two days, people will need things to do. So, and I hope that, that we will be able to at least make a very good start on that by 2050, or rather, in my case, certainly my children will. And, and so, so there's an example of, of now and the future where I think we can change things. No, perfect. Like, uh, this was really uh, enlightening for me uh, as well, uh, like examples from 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and now. Like, uh, it seems like uh, the, we need to relearn the learnings, uh, let's say, because uh, there is an idea that, uh, like, in 21st century, skills will be different. In 21st century, uh, like education will be different. No one knows how to proceed. But again, looking back, uh, like scientific approach, we know that science is a great tool for, to understand our environment. Uh, and uh, it's a very practical tool. And it, with the step-by-step -step inventions and discoveries, science is an, like treasure right now. And again, from the exper experiences, that we had until now, uh, like, what is the suggestion? What might be the uh, key thing uh, to consider that will not have a negative impact on society and nature when we when we invent something new? What should be the questions asked uh, first? I think I think we we don't know at the point of invention or in at the point of introduction and, and, and the appliance of those inventions, we, we don't know all the possible impacts. We don't know the good ones, all of them, and, and we don't know the bad ones, all of them. We know probably the, the, the predicted results of, of, of the application, but that's as far as it goes. So I think we need standards. We need societal standards that we monitor and evaluate and that we intervene. Yeah? So, so that we don't, again, another practical example, and I ask myself this, there are still, in, in many countries, there are still a lot of diesel cars. Mm -hmm. We have known for many years that diesel emissions are bad for the environment. Mm -hmm. Why does it take such a long time to end diesel engines? Mm -hmm. yeah? because, because invention wise we were we've been ready to, 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 to end this for a long time mm -hmm. and it is another example where because we lack common standards because we lack good monitoring and evaluation and intervention that this is allowed to happen and if you wish that that the profiteering can continue so we need positive proactive regulation yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question, isn't it? You know, can we have society standards such as transparency and honesty? Because yeah, that's what this is about. It is about our expectations of how we, as a human race, should, should function. Can we make political dishonesty a crime? Yeah, if we're being lied to by the people who we elect, mm -hmm. surely that's enough for us to say we don't want you here anymore. Yeah, can we punish profiteering and tax and tax avoidance and at the same time encourage positive behaviors mm -hmm. so we need to we, we need leaders who take us to positive proactive regulation to make the world a better place yeah. and of course as a result then we ourselves need to continue to lead by example so that our children our young people um can follow that example and and 
and better it, quite frankly. And I think thirdly, in order to reach those decisions, we need better and more information mm -hmm. from everywhere. Right? And so, so not just if you think purely in educational terms, what information do we actually have? We have test results, we have examination results, and we have things like attendance and behavior. And apart from that, we know very little. Well, we need to know more. So I think we need to look for more sources of information that allow us to make better decisions. So, you know, I, I, I do uh, some work with some friends who, who run a, a company called Go Bubble, which is, which is uh, social media for under 13 year olds. We should look into that and find out the information that we can glean from what those children are thinking and what they're wanting. Yeah, and of course, we, I, I work on the other hand with very sophisticated market research companies like the Insights people, as well as universities. So we need to widen our net in terms of the quality information and, and, and transparency of information that we get so that we can inform better judgments. And as we well know, if we look back at the politics of the last four years, particularly in the United States, um, you know, there were times when we all looked at each other and actually didn't know what the truth was anymore. Well, you can't make the world a better place if you don't know what the truth is. So I think there is an issue of ethics and morality that links to science, invention and progress. Sorry, I had a problem uh, with the connection. Uh, like ethics and morality, you said like you said uh, three other things as well, uh, like uh, uh, appreciating the right behavior, right approach, yes. uh, like uh, regulating the uh, let's say in the scope of this conversation, bad approach, uh, bad examples, and also more information from everywhere. So like yes, I uh, like. I was in primary school 20 years ago, and the uh, learning, methodology, learning methodology that was followed in Turkey and in most of, uh, the, like in most places of the world, was subject matter learning. And in this methodology, uh, what uh, what was uh, uh, what was the method? Like we were going to classes. And the, the class was named geography, for example, or <laughs> history. And we were only learning uh, from history perspective. And that perspective was so limited that it, uh, most of the time it was serving to another like intention, uh, another will uh, of the maybe uh, of maybe uh, governments and uh, powerful societies, people. And when I look to the uh, maybe trends uh, right now, I see that people are talking about interdisciplinary learning or skill-based learning. What will be the main difference while we are going from subject matter learning to skill-based learning? And do you think this will, uh, this will affect um, this um, uh the things that you have mentioned uh in previous question like do you think skill-based learning or uh, interdisciplinary learning will increase uh, the good examples or will uh, not have any effect on the good examples what do you think about this i think it's an interesting thing and I, I'd, I'd just like to take a step back on this so so we have kind of if you wish subject matter learning on the one hand and we have skills skills based learning on the other and, and I think that um, it isn't a matter of either or. I think it has to be a matter of both. So, and in that sense, education doesn't change. I think, or its purpose doesn't change. Mm -hmm. But what has changed is that we've stood still. And, and, and I'll give perhaps some examples of that a little bit later on. So, so subject matter learning and skills-based learning is a matter of theory and practice. Yeah, it's a matter of the academic versus purpose. It's a matter of dots and lines. So, so if you think about it, the school subject, I use this, this image quite a lot. The school, if you think of a sheet of paper and you have 20 dots or 15 dots on the paper, 
and they are unconnected and they are um, sitting there and they're the subjects, okay? When you put a learner, a child in a position to find out the practical application of those subjects, what you will see is that the child begins to, at least in their mind, draw lines between the dots. So they make sense of what they're doing. And, and when I travel or used to travel before the pandemic from, from Istanbul to Sao Paulo and, and all sorts of other places, um, wherever I go, I ask children, why do you go to school? And, and the answer I get far too often is because I have to. And if I then go back 200 years at the time of the Industrial Revolution, if you ask children in a very limited way, of course, why do you go to school? They would have an answer because the purpose of going to school was to do the right thing on the assembly lines in the factories, for example. They may not have liked the purpose always, but they understood the purpose. So society's moved on, the world has moved on, but, but in schooling terms, we haven't moved with it. So subject matter learning and skills-based learning need to go hand in hand. Another example is there are what I would call basics, reading and writing. There is very little that you can do in life without, in terms of success, without being able to read or write, be that reading and writing instructions or reading and writing books and all sorts of things. So, so essentially, the subject matter enables us to be better in the world outside. And what we need to do is we need to enable young people to understand that going to school is a satellite navigation system to better places in life. We need to connect the subject matter learning with skills-based learning. And then, of course, then, of course, you do have that thing about experiences, everything. So once you've got the subject matter, you can then attach exemplification and experiences to that so that this makes much more sense. Very practical example. When I went to school, I didn't like mathematics, why? particularly algebra. Why? Because I didn't understand why I had to do it. This teacher would stand in front of us and go, if A is 2 and B is 3, what is C? I don't care. I don't even know the language you're speaking or what you're asking me. But when I went to my language lessons, German lesson in particular, my teacher was brilliant. He put us in touch with children in Germany. So I completely understood why it was important to learn the language. Otherwise, I would not be able to communicate with people. I think they're very simple examples, but they also apply in a very complex way. So it is an issue of experience-based learning to make the subject matter teaching real and that in turn gives purpose and purpose motivates so we need to think about one who are the teachers yeah and so sometimes it might be that somebody from industry who comes and talks to a group of youngsters is as much as a teacher as the mathematics teacher because the children learn from this person and it may mean that we need to think to a degree about the role of the teachers differently, that they don't just teach a subject matter, but they also become, they become facilitators of the experiences and they become allies of, of, of empowerment to those children. So that is a revisit that we need because I think we've lost, for our children, we have lost the purpose of what we are trying to achieve in our schooling and in our education. Uh, like uh, it was a very strong message. And uh, like uh, while you are talking, I'm also considering the things that we are doing in twin science. And uh, like we, we are trying to uh, build on subject matter learning because like uh, we are employees of twin science team. Uh, are the product of subject matter learning. And I am happy with the education I got in general, right? So that, there were dots and there were some ro role models in my life uh, to show me how to connect those dots. But these role models are not everywhere. 
right? So uh, as a company, we are trying to use technology for children uh, to maybe connect these dots in a right way. And while connecting, like having the idea, having the main idea in mind, having the purpose in mind that all the things that you are learning now will turn something beneficial for society. And you will be the one that, uh, that, that will invent something, find something, say something new uh, to, um, to lead society uh, in a better way, right? So I think, I, if I just may interrupt, I'm sorry, but I think, I think the point you mentioned about role models is incredibly important. And I think we, we, if we think back, I think to my role models, my role model, my, my immediate role models as a child were my grandfather, uh, my, my football and manager's role model was Johan Cruyff, but I, also, but I also wanted to be Christian Barnard, who performed the first heart transplant operation. I wanted to be Martin Luther King because I wanted to be able to speak like him, and I wanted to be my German teacher, and I became a German teacher because of my German teacher. I didn't want to be an interesting, we have that, you know, uh, I didn't want to be a footballer. I wanted to be Johan Cruyff. And with all the values that come with that. And I think sometimes what we do at the moment is we ask children what they want to be when they grow up. I think we should ask them the question who they want to be when they grow up, because I think immediately you begin to attach uh, uh, values to that. Mm -hmm. And role model, and we are all potential role models. And the other thing I would say about role modeling is that if you come from a very disadvantaged background, the the depth and breadth of role model that is available to you is probably less than if you come from an advantaged background. So communities, societies led by schools and families need to lead the way to look particularly after young people from disadvantaged backgrounds so that they too can access a full menu of role models. We need to be consciously aware of that. And, and as you know, particularly in the area of science, there have been historically all sorts of issues around role modeling. So, so it is not that long ago that women scientists were a rarity, partly because there was a lack of role model. We now have more women sci scientists, and in my view is they have an especial duty to act as role models to more and more girls all of them depri deprived and not deprived so that they can fulfill their potential and fulfill their dreams. So the role model aspect you raise is absolutely crucial. So like technology is a nice tool to maybe uh, like use these role models uh, and uh, like uh, reach to more people around the world. It's a very pow powerful tool. It becomes less costly to reach rural parts uh, of the world, this yes. echoes of the society. So uh, our main vision is to fill this knowledge gap, maybe role model gap that you pointed out uh, for uh, all children. And uh, there is a question that I ask to myself, like uh, being a role model is a nice thing, but we need to be sure about ourselves as well, right? So what we are saying should be true and what we, we shouldn't uh, drift to uh, like uh, drift, for, drift from our in, intentions away. We need to revisit our purpose. We need to remember yes. our purpose, which is a better future. And sometimes like it becomes an existential uh, <laughs> uh, problem for individuals that has the power in their hands, right? And yes. Seeing the examples of this uh, all the time. So, 21st century learning model, uh, like uh, the maybe uh, what we say is our. Uh, this might be this might not be a question for you, but uh, maybe just a comment. So, in uh, to win, we say double wing approach is important. Like at one side, you need to know the uh, you need to have conscience to prioritize uh, right problems. Because like when you focus on a problem, you spend time on it, you spend energy on it, and you become you, you come up with a solution. 
Uh, so we need to be able to prioritize our problems and our time uh, in a conscious way. And also, it is not enough because I, I've seen lots of people that they are focusing on the right problem, but they don't have enough skills to uh, come up with a solution. Uh, so they need to be skillful as well. Uh, so this conscience and skill part, competency part, conscience and competency part, when they are united, we uh, think that uh, people are um, asking the right questions more and more, Ask, uh, prioritize, prioritizing and developing their, themselves uh, in a better uh, way. What do you think about this double wing approach? Uh, conscience and competency should be given to uh, kids together. I think I think absolutely I think absolutely, but I think we, we need to remind ourselves. And you you mentioned earlier the word reflect and 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 also honesty within this. I, I think I think we need to remind ourselves uh, of the state of schooling and the state of education. And and I think one of the things that we need to remember is that that in our schooling, we perhaps in principle haven't changed as much as we like to think. So I'm going to. I'm going to try for for two minutes to play a little game with you and and with the audience. Yeah, I'm, so I'm going to give you a brief description or a word, and I want you to every time I mention the word, I want you to have two images in your head: one image from uh, 1921 and one image from 2021. Okay, hundred okay. times spent. Yeah. So 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 I'm going to give you the first one that is car. So I'd like you to have a picture of a car right. in, 20, uh, in, in 1921 and a car in 2021. Okay, can you see them? Can you see them both? Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay. okay. Yeah. Then, then housing. Can you um, can you think of a picture in 1921 housing and in 2021 housing? Yeah. Two okay. two pictures. Very clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then the operating theater in a hospital. 1921. 2021. Uh, hospital, you said? Yeah, so the operating theatre in a hospital. Mm -hmm. Okay? And again, you get two very distinct pictures on you. An aeroplane in 1921 and an aeroplane in 2021. Very different. Very distinctly different. Yeah? yeah okay. Right. Now the last one. The last one. A classroom in 1921 and a classroom in 2021, most probably uh, only only the uh, color of the photo changed, right? <laughs> exactly. Okay. So so, and I agree. I think I think out of all those monumental differences, all at the same time, probably the most important one has undergone the least change. So when we say that we've reached advancements in schooling. We haven't really, because we still have, mostly have children facing the front, they put their hands up, there's a whiteboard instead of a blackboard. It is still about teaching and not learning predominantly. Yeah? And I know that this is a kind of slightly black and white representation, but I think, I think significant elements of that are true. But at the same time, the education potential has increased enormously because we're on iPhones, iPads, we've got the internet, we everything... We can access everything. I, I do some, some work with a company called Atlantic Productions. They've just sent me an app they're about to launch where I had a dinosaur on my daughter's plate the other day through AI, whatever it is. It was, it was extraordinary, right? So I think we need to begin to genuinely reflect what we are doing in our schooling and at the same time look at, at, at aids and technology like Atlantic Productions, but also like Go Bubble and the work that Twin Science does and say, where does all this brilliance in terms of educational resourcing and, and communication channels, where on earth do we fit this in? And I think that's the discussion to be had. So when we talk about, you know, linking the subject matter to linking skills, we need to think about how, how do we make the magic happen? And, and still do the basics because without reading and writing, you can't do all that. But, but, but where is the awe and wonder in it? Where is the bit where the youngsters go, wow? 
<laughs> yeah, and we need, and, and in that sense, we need the wow back. Yeah, like that effect of wow uh, is essential. Uh, I, while you are talking, like I'm looking back to my education uh, uh, timeline and I am picking the right role models, uh, like the methods uh, that uh, uh, that were accurate for me, that were effective for me, uh, for mm -hmm. my learning. Uh, uh, so uh, all the things that uh, you have mentioned, actually they unite uh, uh, yeah. effective methodology. So and I think I think that there's one thing that we need to highlight here, which 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 we have to do, and this is that one of the things that the pandemic has done, it has shone a light on on inequality, that is staggering it, the inequality has not been caused by the pandemic it was always there the pandemic has brought it to the fore yeah and that is the that is the lack of internet access free internet access that so many children have so our world is now a world of have and have not and have and have not equal can and cannot and and that just that cannot be right if we want the Cadbury's world in education, we need to make free internet access the educational equivalent of health free clean water. Okay. Otherwise, we, we, we condemn hundreds of millions of children to be second rate citizens. And that is not our job. Our job is for them not to be second rate citizens. Uh, thank you. Like, uh but it has been very enlightening and uh, I want to move on. I have questions, but also our friends mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. have some questions and uh, maybe you can open up your uh, cameras, uh, whoever has a question and we can start directing uh, uh, them to Professor Gagraus, uh, everyone. So like, I've seen some of the questions they have been writing to me and uh, the, there are some practical questions like uh, uh, I'm very curious about the answers of them as well. Maybe we can start with Ainush. Uh, Ainush, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, uh, you can open up your camera and directly uh, uh, ask your question if you have. I, I don't think I will be able to open up because yeah, it's just go ahead and it's ask. just host disabled. Okay, but I can ask my question. Hi, uh, my name is Ainur. I'm working with the content team. Uh, one of the questions that I have, uh, while we are creating the educational content, like sometimes it's like we are having difficulty to ha like find the right balance between fun and education. So it's a little bit tricky for us. And sometimes we feel like we are sacrificing one aspect by focusing on the other one. So my question is, how can we make sure that, you know, educational part is still fun, but as well as we are providing the fun at the same time? Thank okay, I, think, uh, I think, thank you for that question. I, I think a couple of things about fun. Fun is, is not just ha 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 fun, yeah? Fun is also enjoyment and curiosity and all those things. So, so first and foremost. Secondly, and probably most importantly, I think there is a misunderstanding about education being fun. So I know somebody who was an Olympic gold medalist. He won the 800 meters and the 1500 meters Olympic gold yeah, some years ago. And, and to him, Winning was fun. Yeah. All the practice and falling over was not fun. And there is nothing wrong in some of it not being fun as long as it leads to enjoyment eventually. Yeah? And one of the lessons of life, which you've experienced and certainly I've experienced, is that not everything is fun. But as long as I understand why it sometimes isn't fun, then that's okay. So my, my, my advice would be not to get too frustrated about not everything being fun and education at the same time. Yeah? 
So eating, eating a good meal at home is fun. Sometimes cooking is also fun. Washing up is not necessarily fun, but if you want to eat again, you have to do it. And, and I think that there's a very practical application in that. And sometimes I think we want, we want everything to be fun. And you know what? It can't be. And that's reality too. So I think, I think you need to think about percentages rather than beat yourself up about everything being fun. Thank like, you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It, it was a really nice approach. So we are trying to do every content. We are trying to transform into something that can hook children, even though they are not interested in some of the topics and the so skills. Uh, like we want them to get interested. Uh, but what you are saying is a bit different than that. Uh, you're saying that they need to experience the challenge as well, right? It's, it's, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? So, so when I, when I just take it, because you're familiar with this, if I take you to Kidzania, for example, where children choose up to 60 activities, 60 different jobs, right? And so I, I, again, when I'm there, I talk to the youngsters and, and reasonably regularly, there will be youngsters who say, I didn't enjoy that. Yeah, a certain activity. And my answer will be brilliant. That's really good. I'm really pleased that you didn't enjoy that because, because you did something, you thought about it, you reflected and you decided. Brilliant process. Without having done that, you could never make your mind up. And, and it, sits in, it sits in that area, doesn't it? Definitely. Like, uh, uh, perfect. So uh, we will move with the next question, Eileen. Uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. And by the way, one of our friends says, this conversation is fun, Professor Gagra. So, Good. Uh, I, hope I, it's I hope it's still fun at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Eileen, go ahead. Thank you very much, first of all, Gagra. Um, I also work in the development team, or the content team as a content, content developer. And I think what impacted me just recently, what you just said was that have and have not has turned into can and cannot. And I truly believe that, like you said, the um, pandemic has highlighted that. And in my mind, I see that, you know, the three pillars of a quality education, and I've heard you say this in the past in your other talks, is that it has to be an edu a quality education has to be fun, like we just talked about. Um, empowering and democratized. And I just was wondering if you could maybe speak more about the democratization of education and what that means for, you know, the future of private entities or tech, uh, ed tech platforms such, of our, such as ourselves at TWIN and perhaps how the democratization of, you know, education could be the answer to solving that inequality um, that we see around the world when it comes to receiving a quality education. Thank you. Think, uh, thank you. I, uh, I, I, I said, I said. By the way, people were only uh, allowed to ask uh, easy questions, so so somebody <laughs> slipped through. The, somebody slipped through the net here. I think the the um, I think the de democratization of education is a very important thing. It's also it's a very simple thing, right? It it is about you can only you can only exercise your your opinion, your vote, you can, oh, if, if you think of democracy from that point of view, yeah, democratic, then you can only do that if you have the means of participation. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it is at a, very, at, a, at a very basic level. So we still, I do some work with the Desmond Tutu Foundation, and there are, there are approximately 20 million children in, in sub-Saharan Africa who don't go to school. So you might reasonably say that in terms of exercising de de their democratic right to be a fully functioning human being, they are severely disadvantaged. Yeah. So, so that's not democratic. So, so that's one thing. I think the other thing is it's a long process. It's a, it's a long process because the way we run our world makes it a long process. It's a little bit like the vaccination uh, uh, for the pandemic, isn't it? The, 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 the best solution would be to tackle this globally because our, our world will not be the same until we do. 
the practical application is that will not happen because 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 the selfishness runs first. Um, I think the other aspect of 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 democratization is this that we also must remember, never lose sight of, that however small the steps are, there are steps and there is evidence. So, so it is within my lifetime, it is within my lifetime, and all of this, of course, is connected to education. It is within my lifetime that Rosa Parks was, was arrested for sitting on a bus and, and not getting up for a white person. It was also in my lifetime that Barack Obama was the first uh, non-white American president. It was also in my lifetime that he was succeeded by Donald Trump. So, so not everything is an upward trend in that sense. If you think of, of how many women scientists there are, so, so if we look at small steps and small examples, then we have to conclude that this is a journey worth being on because we can make this happen. Yeah. Now, now a company, an enlightened organization like, like Twin Science has the ability in itself to lead by example. Yeah, and it can do this, it can do this in terms of gender, it can do this in terms of ethnicity, it can do this within a number of countries in terms of access. We should perhaps think differently. So, for example, this is this is a simple example. Um, for example, in terms of access, and access is a, is a democratizing force. Um, have you thought about selling twin science to poorer kids for less money? Right? So, so if you go to Kidzania, many of the Kidzanias globally, if you come from a school from a disadvantaged background, you will pay far less to get in than if you come from a school from an advantaged background. So a little bit of a Robin Hood model going on here. So, yeah. so I think if we want this, we have to think hard and we have to hurt our heads and make these things happen. And if people say that's not possible, I don't believe that. There is always an answer to something. So, so it's a slow process. And the answer is disappointing in many ways because, because it, it will not be fulfilled in my lifetime, neither will it be fulfilled in yours. But I'll tell you, if we don't do our little bit, it will take even longer. And, and when we do it, we need to be proud that we are. So look around you and make that difference. That's everybody's responsibility. This and challenge, This challenge is pretty fun for us as well, uh, Professor. Graham. I'm sure, I'm sure. And I, and I know that you think, uh, I know that you think like that. But, but this is, so now uh, the next question has to be easier than this. Yeah. Meaning, of, <laughs> meaning of life. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. I really appreciate no, it. You're very welcome. So, uh, Chala, are you here? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you for speaking to us today. It's been very inspiring. We were looking forward to it. Uh, and I, I think what you say about income equality here, I find that very important. And actually, we've been talking about what kind of project we can create with that very title, income equality, because what we're doing here, it requires internet access. And what you say about free internet access and it's being equal in importance to access to clean water, that's crucial. And somehow with the pandemic, many children in Turkey gained access to internet for the first time in their lives. But this also brought forward the dire situation, uh, which is there are still many more children left without access, like the numbers in millions. And one of our main missions here should be make, should be, um, it should be to make sure that these children gain access and gain digital literacy as soon as possible. But um, this will undoubtedly take some time. This is a process. So there is what we want to achieve, but then there is a reality of the situation. So what about the children who have no access to internet, who come from disadvantaged backgrounds until then, like right now? And what, what methods do you think we can use to reach them? What is the role of like books or TV broadcasts should be here or what are the other formats do you think we can use to get in touch with children i'm um if the school system is failing them what can we as twin as this company who creates inspiring and educational content for children what can we do i think i, I think there are a, a, a number of issues here first firstly if i may um you you could and we can talk about this you could as a as, as, as a company as an organization 
as part of your corporate and social responsibility, you could lead the way. Right? You could say as a company, this is entirely at the top of my head, so please don't turn off. <laughs> um, uh, this is entirely at the top of my head, but you could say that you leading by example will impose a tax on yourself. You will take 5% of all your profits and you will give that to an organization that enables children to have access to the internet. Your, your senior managers in the company can go and talk to all the other companies in your field and encourage them to do the same. We, the movement needs to be created from the bottom up. If we wait for our politicians to do that for us, it will not happen. It needs to be driven from the bottom up. So first and foremost, you know, if you think you were, I, I think I met, I met some of your colleagues at Bet London in 2020, it may have been, well, imagine if every company that was present at Bet London decided to take 5% or 4%, no, let's make it 5%, 5% of their profits and, and filter that to an organization, save the children, the UN, whoever these people are, and say, right, there you are. Uh, if everybody did that, that would take us quite a long way. In the meantime, you're quite right. We have children who don't have access to the internet. And how do we access them? And, and the answer is this, and this is, this is shame on many governments. Um, during the pandemic, the people who know their children best are the people who have not been trusted and who have been ignored in many ways, and they're called teachers. Now, I, I think the teaching profession has done an amazing job under incredibly difficult circumstances to be quick, to react, to be inventive, to be, to be creative, to, to, to persevere, right? And if you want the answer to your question, the answer lies locally. So I was talking to a, to a principal of a school in India, in, in Delhi, and, uh, and a number of his children have internet access at home, and a number of the children don't. And the children who don't are rural, yeah? And they come into school by bus. So what the school did is it kept the bus running. But if the bus had no children on it, the bus had work on it. So they would put the work on the bus in the morning, they would drive into the villages, the children would collect the work, they would do the work the next morning, they would put it back on the bus. So, so kind of necessity is the mother of invention. They kept it going. And the question is, is it equal? No, it isn't. Is it better than having no education at all? Yes, it is. And good for these teachers. So imagine if we took you guys to India and said, come on, let's put some twin, twin science packs on those buses. So, so there's, always, there's always a way, but the way has to be through the schools. There's one of my favorite football clubs is Barcelona Football Club. And Barcelona Football Club uh, has a motto. And the motto is Mesco and Club more than a club. And I think what we've learned in the pandemic, that good schools are more than a school. Mm -hmm. And those are the schools we need to work with and those are the schools that you need to work with. And, and somebody just put up, yay, Barca. I, 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 Johan Cruyff was manager there. He started La Messia, so that's where that all came from. But, but, that's, but that's the bit about you as a private sector company interacting with those who know the children best to achieve the best things for the children. The better you are as a company at what you do, the more you will sell, ironically, but the more difference you will make with those kids. Your success lies in quality and honesty. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, we will have one last question from Idil. Idil, go ahead and open your cam and you can direct your question to Professor Gross. But like leading by example is a great uh, learning for uh, us as well because Twin uh, was born with a social responsibility project and we need to revisit and remember that uh, vision all the time to fill the knowledge gap. And uh, one, one of the questions that I asked you before was about like, we are having hard time to communicate our vision and our methodology, our approach with society. And you, you have said that it doesn't mean that that vision is wrong. We need to do a better job just to communicate it. So like uh, wrapping up your last answer, uh, I understand that our marketing team needs to work more to communicate 
it in a better way uh, for the society. Uh, we will help. We will find ways with your guidance, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Professor Grouse. Uh, this has been a very enlightening conversation. So thank, thank you very you. much. Um, so in our app Twing, we really want kids to be able to discover their own interest areas. Uh, but at the same time, like the one question that I always have in my mind is whether uh, we are like narrowing kids areas of interest too much by recommending activities that really interest them. Like my question is, how can we find the right balance between um, really exposing children to different interest areas? but at the same time, making sure that they have the freedom to focus on the interest area that they're really interested in, you know? Um, and the other, sorry, it, it's a two part. No, 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 no. The other question is that, you know, your interest area is formed based on what you're exposed to in your life. And if they're not exposed to certain areas, then they're never going to be able to pick that area. So uh, do we, is it our duty to actually show kids that other areas exist and how do yes. we actually shatter these societal stereotypes that lead kids to pursue certain areas? So I think I'll, I'll try and roll the answer of your question, thank you, in, into one. Children can only aspire to what they know exists, right? End of, end of story. And it is all of our duties, call it role model, twin, twin as a company is a role model. Yeah, so, so, so we do a number of things. We, we let children taste. Yeah, we let them we let them try. Mm -hmm. And if they don't like the taste, it's a bit like being in that brilliant Turkish delight shop in, in, in Istanbul, right? Some things you like and some things you don't, but you don't know what you don't like if you don't try. So 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 maybe twin needs to think about elements of taster courses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing. Always link it to reality, exemplification, yeah? and link it to a reality of the possible and the important. And the important, so, so the highlighting to girls who got your product in certain parts of Turkey, the, the existence of women scientists is incredibly important. So, so you, you choose to highlight certain parts that might not be familiar to those children. Then in terms of do we narrow them down too much or, and how do we avoid this? I think you, you let children taste and they like it or they don't. I think you, you provide content. Most of it's fun and some of it isn't, and that's okay. And then thirdly, I think you signpost. Yeah, so you go, now that you've done this activity, have you also thought about, and here on YouTube is, or, or whatever it is that you can connect to. So what do you, so every child who finishes an activity should have three or four signposts that they can follow yeah, as, as a follow-up. Then imagine that each of those three or four signposts itself has another three or four signposts. And all of a sudden you're into a massive spider's web. Right? But, but so, so it is the approach, because it happens particularly in the private sector sometimes, don't we? Ours is the only product, ours is the most important product. No. Ours is a good product and it is part of an enormous jigsaw. And when we finish with our product, we will show you the other pieces of that jigsaw. And I think that good development forward will not be in isolation, but it will be with purpose and with passion and in partnership. And I think, I think those things are incredibly important. That, so, so for example, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of, of advisory work for an organization in the United States called Hello Genius. Now, I know that Hello Genius, which, which is a, a developing content platform for children and families, I already know that Hello Genius, as a general platform, is very interested in talking to twin science about sharing content. Why wouldn't you do that? You, you can come to the commercial arrangements and all that, but purely for educational purposes, of course you should do that. And it is, so it is about those kind of partnerships that in the end, everybody wins, but the people who win most are the children. And that feels to me like a pretty good balance to start with, really. Yeah, like uh, purpose, passion, and partnership might be the three words, three main words that we need. 
Rome. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think you've got I think you've got most of those. Certainly, the purpose and the, and the passion you have in abundance. I I, I would say that so. Thank, thank, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Idil, for your question as well. So I feel that we will have uh, these uh, kind of uh, talks uh, more and more in near future with our teams, uh, like focusing on marketing side, focusing on content side, because we have a lot to learn uh, from you, Professor. Uh, just, I think there is one more question, uh, but we are ahead of our time a little bit. Uh, uh, but Omar has something, some one, one last question, but it kind of, uh, uh, the answer, you, you already given the answer to Omar's question. He wrote me from backside, but thank you for your participation to our talk uh, today. Uh, My pleasure. Uh, can I just ask you, can I ask you a question? Are most of your colleagues based in Istanbul or are they based all over? Yeah. Uh, most most of our colleagues are based in Istanbul. We have colleagues in London, Amsterdam, and other parts of the world in, from the state. And we think uh, we we are planning to expand our team in 2021 as well. Globally. We should we should we should make it our aim to have our next meeting in 2021 in Istanbul. The next time we meet like this, yeah. ideally, it should be in Istanbul. Definitely, our, th our team will look forward to that, I think, because uh, let me give you some comments from our team. Nije, uh, she's our UI UX uh, designer. Uh, uh, she says, Nije, why don't you open your camera and tell what you... Actually, all of you guys, you can open up your cameras and uh, maybe we can close up today's talk. Uh, Nije, what, what was your comment about Professor? Jihan, I didn't want to steal some more time from people, but uh, Professor, I had so much fun, the uh, the quality kind of fun. Thank you so much for your talk. It was, it was the best example possible for educative and fun combining together. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for saying so. Thank you. And I, I just I just read some comments uh, from Chess chat, uh, but uh, everyone feels uh, really grateful uh, for you being here today. Uh, and we will- uh, most maybe, of maybe one last comment, like this is my third meeting with Professor Grass and you know, we are talking with a lot of educators or educative distributors, people who are in this field. But most of the time, what we were seeing was like, people have got this best educational system in their mind and they are trying to, you know, push the children uh, the way that they wish. But what is the difference with the professor? And we got so much excited uh, every time when we meet him is that actually uh, we see that uh, from a uh, professor from you that we should think what is best for the child, uh, not what, what is best uh, of ourselves. So uh, it's not so easy to find uh, uh, educators like you. So thank you very much again for accepting our invitation. And, thank you. Uh, talk. Yeah. Uh, I'll, see you. I'll see you soon. That'd be great. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so uh, going to Haji Bekir and afterwards maybe a meeting uh, towards Bosphorus uh, for 2021. Uh, will be our uh, one of our milestones, Professor. Uh, thank you for your time and all the things that you have shared. Bye-bye. Perfect. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now.